uh, webinar we're holding this afternoon. Uh, I wanted to just start out, my name is Martha Rabor. I'm the executive director of the Shot at Life campaign. Wanted to start out with some technology reminders. So I see some people have already signed in from Kentucky and Nevada. So thank you for using the chat. Feel free to do that throughout our conversation. But I would ask you if to ask questions, please go specifically to the Q&A. Um, that's gonna be the best way for us to, to take in the questions. Uh, so again, thrilled to have you all here. I think we have a, a nice big number today and I'm not surprised this is such an important topic. Uh, again, my name is Martha Rabour and I'm the executive director of the Shot at Life campaign at the UN Foundation. And we focus on, we say, getting kids to their fifth birthday. So we do that by increasing access to vaccines and we are a grassroots advocacy organization. Um, so today we are going to be talking about why racial justice matters so much in global health advocacy and how all advocates can become more aware of these issues when talking to their members of Congress and in their own communities. Um, global health simply cannot be looked at without a lens of racial justice and that, you know, we all know that there are racial uh, inequalities and inequities, um, but the statistics when you look at them can really be alarming. So for instance, we know that globally life expectancy is up to 20 years lower, 20 years younger for indigenous populations than non-indigenous populations. So just a little, a little stat to get us started. Um, so if we put this discussion in the context of the SDGs, so you're all global health advocates, I'm sure you know the SDGs are the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and these goals are the UN's sort of roadmap and blueprint for 2015 to 2030 to uh, help end extreme poverty and help people around the globe thrive. So I know for Shot at Life, we focus particularly on uh, SDG3, uh, and that's the one we're kind of talking about today when we talk about global health, but we know that this SDG, just like all the other ones, can't be achieved without working on, you know, number 10, which is reduced inequality. So we're going to be focusing on sort of those two SDGs, but we know all the SDGs uh, cannot be achieved unless we really focus on reducing inequalities. So our panelists have a lot to say, so I am going to just jump right into introducing them and letting them talk about it. So uh, the first panelist I'd like to introduce is Lois Pace. Lois is the president and executive director of the Global Health Council. Uh, she has served as the council president and executive director since 2016. She is frequently quoted in the media uh, and is sought after as a public speaker. She has championed policies for access to essential medicines. She's testified for congressional global health appropriations and has elevated the voices of people at the community level around various shared advocacy goals. So welcome, Lois. Um, Next up, maybe you can wave so people know. Next up, we have uh, Rachel Pittman, Executive Director um, of UNA USA. And um, that is a grassroots movement. I know we have some UNA USA members on, but for those of the, you who don't know, it's a grassroots movement of more than 20,000 Americans in over 200 chapters across the US who are dedicated to supporting the work of the United Nations of the United Nations in communities, on university campuses, and Capitol Hill. And Rachel works really hard to maximize UNA USA's advocacy impact by guiding the strategic vision for the organization. She also oversees membership expansion and manages partnerships while also spearheading new initiatives that all support this goal of a very strong US-UN partnership. Our third panelist is Mike Beard, who is the Global Health Director at the Better World Campaign, also at the UN Foundation. Uh, Mike, in his role, directs the Better World Campaign's Global Health Initiatives and the advocacy portfolio of UNF's signature campaign. And this is vast. This portfolio includes malaria, global immunization programs, girls' empowerment, 
women's and girls' health issues, reproductive health issues, the sustainable development goals, and most recently, um, he has been very involved and really critical element in supporting the World Health Organization uh, in front of the US government, which has been a challenge this summer. So from funding the UN through appropriations bills to securing bipartisan support for the Girls Count Act of 2015, Mike and his team have achieved major legislative successes and we have seen unprecedented support for the United Nations and its activities by Congress. So now I'd like to pass it over to Lois to uh, introduce herself a little bit more and talk about her organization. Over to you, Lois. Thanks very much, Martha. And uh, my regards to the team at Shot at Life uh, for hosting this dialogue. We at Global Health Council uh, obviously support this work. I shouldn't say obviously, in fact, but, um, but I, I'd like to think it's obvious that we support this work uh, and this kind of discussion. I think it's really helpful um, for those of us in the global health community in particular um, but across international development to really think deeply about the issue of or issues around racial equity and injustice uh, globally as it relates to our work and just as it relates to our lives. So um, thanks for having me uh, be a part of this. Um, in terms of what Global Health Council is doing in this space, I think I want to back up and just make sure people understand the kind of organization that we are. Uh, so we're an advocacy coalition uh, based here in Washington, D.C. What that typically means is we are doing a lot of work um, similar to, to how Shot at Life works. Um, we're, we're doing a lot to try and push the global health agenda, only we don't have a specific, um, I guess, objective or issue on which we focus. Um, we're covering everything from AIDS to Zika. And I think given our platform and given our priorities, it really um, behooves us at GHC to think um, critically about what the U.S. is doing across the spectrum of global health. And we are very much focused on the U.S. role because of, again, our position here in, in Washington. What we have been talking about um, over the past few years, not just this year, is really challenging the status quo of U.S. global health, recognizing that there's been a lot of good um, that we'd like to think has been done and that we've been able to show is happening as a result of these initiatives, these investments. Um, but I think it's obvious to say that it's not perfect or it's, it's really, I think we can say now at least that, that, it, that it's, not, it's not the best that we can do. And so I think we'll get a little bit more into this um, as we kind of carry on with our conversation today. Um, but our hope at GHC is really to I don't know, challenge us all to think about how we do better, especially in light of something like uh, racial inequities, uh, knowing that that is a major driver for maybe why we're not quite getting across the finish line. Um, I, an example I'd like to point to um, before passing, passing the mic to others is um, even just thinking about the, the language we use in the space and the narrative we have around US global health. So things like they need our help, or we need to protect ourselves, or even, um, even the, the sense that we're winning the fight. Um, and I think you know, when it comes to some of the language we use, it's really important to think about from whose perspective that's um, where we're making those statements. You know, how, how are we making progress and for whom, right? Like who's really measuring that um, and counting that as success? Or um, this idea of you know, the US being protected, why should we be the only ones to benefit from the work that we do? Or why does that need to be sort of a leading indicator um, of success for us, let alone um, this idea of, of the world needing our help? I think we have been wonderfully benevolent actors over the years. And also, um, given the current situation with today's pandemic, I think we can do to have a, a lot of humility um, as a country too. So I, I think you know, I'd love to talk more about how we reframe that and how that, that relates to racial equity, but I'll end it there, Martha, and, um, and chime in a little bit later. Thanks. Well, excellent points. Thank you. And I, I think language is so important, and I'm, I'm sure that's something that we'll get into. I did want to point out, though, it looks like you're having a great virtual conference. Love the name. <laughs> um, so if People don't see that on their screen, let us know, but November 19th to 20th, pandemics, politics, and, and privilege. So we'll all look forward to, to signing up for that. And thank you so much, uh, Lois, for your 
for your introduction. Uh, next, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague who I miss seeing around the office terribly. Uh, Rachel, please go right ahead. Thank you, Martha. UNA USA. Thank you, Martha, and thank you um, to your team for having me here for this really important discussion. And as you said earlier, I um, lead a grassroots movement of, of 20,000 Americans in 200 chapters across the US, um, where we really uh, focus on supporting the UN by trying to advocate for strong US leadership at the UN and most importantly, full US funding for the UN. And I think what's important to know is that UNA USA, we are stewards of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is a UN document of principles that UN member states signed on to support um, and to uphold. So these are rights such as right to work, right to marriage, voting, um, adequate health and well being. So things like shelter and access to, to medical care and so forth. Um, no matter your race, your religion, uh, your language, or any other distinguishable factor. And we believe that, you know, with the UDHR, that ultimately you would have freedom and you would have um, justice and peace in the world. And our first chairwoman, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, who founded many chapters at UNA USA, um, was the person who helped uh, shepherd the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, to its completion. So I say all this because um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is in the spirit of UNA USA. And we use that to educate, mobilize, and inspire individuals um, to take civic action on advancing the sustainable development goals, as well as to advocate um, for strong US leadership at the UN. So I think um, I'm really excited about being in this conversation today and to talk about how our members of UNA USA is taking notice um, through um, going through this pandemic <laughs> of COVID-19 um, and, and acknowledging that there are so many inequalities. Um, I think COVID-19 is bringing light to all the inequalities um, for people of color, people with disabilities, um, the lack of gender equality. All of this is coming to light um, and UNA members are just more um, engaged and more um, wanting to make change and using those SDGs so that we can fight against things like systematic racism uh, in the US and around the world. So I'm just excited to be here and I look forward to our discussion to tell you um, specifically what UNA USA members are doing. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, just great to, to bring it to um, what's happening right now with a pandemic and how some things that um, a lot of us, a lot of people were aware of have really come into stark detail. And so I'm really interested in having our, us talk more about that. And I know our participants uh, on the line will probably have a lot of questions too for us to answer about that. Um, but I'd like now to turn it over to another colleague who I haven't seen in months, unfortunately, used, used to seeing around the office, um, my colleague, Mike Beard. Mike, it's to you. Thank you so much, Martha, and, and to, the, to the whole Shot at Life team for putting this on. Um, again, my name is Mike Beard. I'm uh, Executive Director of UN Foundation Advocacy and the Global Health Director of the Better World Campaign. And I, I, I mostly just want to jump into the conversation because, one, I, I know I'm going to learn a lot from it. But I just wanted to say two things about, uh, about my other panelists because uh, I think uh, and and the org that they work for are they are so powerful um, as we have been working on this World Health Organization stuff over the last uh, four months or so um, Lois and I like I put I, I worked with Lois to we, we put together a letter in support of WHO and within a few days a thousand organizations and individuals had already signed on the reach and breadth of Global Health Council is just really amazing, and so it, it's just a privilege to be on on a call like this with with um, with Lois, and then Rachel and I, I love UNA USA, and, and Rachel is 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 somebody that I've really really enjoyed working with for so long. But what US, UNA USA really embodies also is is 
is the more democratic way in which the goal setting of the sustainable development goals were put together. And I think that that's really important to this conversation about um, racial justice and equity. If you had taken what were the Millennium Development Goals, and I know we're going to get into the Sustainable Development Goals more, but if you look at what the Millennium Development Goals were, it's more of a top-down approach to, to setting goals. And a lot of them were around health. But as Rachel knows and was a part of, like what UNA USA did was bring the conversation to people in the United States about what really mattered to them. And we were then able to give that to the, to the UN itself and, and help helping to craft these new sustainable development goals. The, or I guess they're not new anymore. We're five years into it. But, but the idea that it is a, a more democratic approach to, um, to goal setting and, and it better encompasses what people around the world really, that what affects them on a daily basis rather than what we're being told they need to address, um, which is, I, I think, to some of these conversations, um, equity uh, and, and justice. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Martha. Can't wait to get into it. Yeah, great. Thank you, Mike. Well, I think we should do that um, because our time is flying by. So I think what I'd like to do, and um, Panos, I'm sure you can easily keep two questions in your head, but I, I'm going to I'm going to ask you each to answer two questions that kind of can turn into three, but they're all related. So why must we address all of the SDGs together in order to succeed on improving global health? So why, how are the other SDGs related to global health? And related to that, so what's the harm of only being sort of laser focused on global health and not taking that more holistic approach? And then the second question is, and this is a much bigger one, how is racism hindering our progress towards global health and the SDGs. So th there's a lot in there, so you can take the parts of it that you want, but I think they make sense combined. Um, and you can either raise your hand or we can go in our regular order, starting with Lois, however. Yeah, you... I'm happy to kick us off, Martha. Thanks for Great. these questions. Um, I, I, you know, I'll start on the topic of SDGs because I think people have heard me uh, lament <laughs> our my obsession with silos and look I get it silos work they've um, we've done a lot of good with um, with having a very focused approach to our work um, and efforts and yet people are just that people and they're not these individual priorities or diseases and so what I, I embrace about the SDGs and why I think uh, to Mike's point um, the powers that be wanted to revisit those in the way that they did um, is that they, you know, the way they're currently framed really allows for us to recognize um, the kind of multiple needs and requirements of global citizens. And so I think that we, you know, we would be remiss if we were only to kind of focus on one area or another, um, even within the health space, let alone across development, um, because then we're, we're ultimately selling you know, selling someone short um, with regards to what they need. And the, and the other thing I'll say, I think you were asking a bit about, you know, kind of what's in it for health or vice versa. Um, leading a health organization, I really think a lot about this because um, I think what I've heard in our community over the years is this question of what's in it for us, right? Um, and how other priorities can serve us and less so how we can serve other priorities. And so, sure, we need healthy children so that those healthy children can go to school, for example. Um, but I think the reverse works as well. We, we know that, um, for example, women who are economic, economically independent can do more for um, their families when it comes to their health care. So there's this symbiotic relationship that I'd like us to recognize and maybe move away from this sense of exceptionalism when it comes to any one issue, because again, the people we serve I don't think they're ranking these issues in the way that we have over time. That's my big commercial for the SDGs for what it's worth. Yeah, and I would, you know, to build upon that, it's kind of like when someone will ask me what's my favorite SDG. I mean, in reality, I mean, they all are because you, you can't have one without the, uh, the other. Um, and in, in this topic, you know, like you just said, if, if there is, um, 
you know, someone doesn't have good health and they can't go to school, if they can't go to school, they can't get a job, if they can't get a job, you know, and it, the, just a domino effect um, of why it's so important to understand that these goals are uh, interrelated. Um, and then also just speaking to um, how racism hinders our progress towards achieving the SDGs, you know, I think that the SDGs ultimately wants to uh, have um, equality for everyone. So if there's racism in the world, that means you are putting down a group, they're not being supported that the way that they should be, and you're going against the meaning of uh, a sustainable, the sustainable development goals. You know, the world would not be sustainable if, um, if it's not equal. So that's kind of what I think of um, when it comes to racism in the SDGs. We're not gonna move forward unless we all move forward together. And I, I, I really don't have much to add um, than what Rachel and Lois have said. I, I do think that, um, and, and one thing is, I was preparing for this is I was thinking a lot about how things have been how things have come together like how the UN was born out of like a post-colonial mindset like the ashes of World War II but it was it was post-colonialism and in the setup of the trustee council and, and that's that's like that's where the UN like rose from and and I think there there needs to be a recognition of some of those post-colonial realities when when um, when you were talking about development overall um, because there there's it's, it's really it's loaded and and if you don't go in with with the mindset of actually even just trying to understand um, what um, the voices of people who um, who who want to see development come to come to pass like like if you don't understand those voices then, then you're never actually going to we're never going to solve the problem or solve any of the problems so i like uh, that's how i've been thinking about things especially for today's conversation it's like and, we need to like, we need to at least we need to understand sorry go ahead rachel no no i was going to say that's so true to be able to understand the history because you know here in the us um health systems uh, years ago where there were um, great hospitals that were for white people and not so great hospitals that were for black people and how that manifest into um, issues with health within the black community over years. So it's kind of being able to understand um, where system systemic racism had started and how it um, led into health issues within the US and how that happens in other places around the world. So it's really important that we kind of dig into uh, the history of these, these issues in order to move forward. So spot on when it comes to things like colonialism. Yeah, I, I, it's a great point. I think systems is something like you said, history and systems are really important to understand of why to Lois's earlier point, why we use certain language, why we are uh, sort of where we are. I, I also want to say, Lois, I really loved your point of the SDGs are great, but people are people. They're, you know, they don't just want good health. They actually also want clean water and they also want equal access. So um, I think you're right. Well, a lot of us, you know, pat ourselves on the back for our impact because we can measure something or try to eradicate a disease. Um, I think it behooves all of us to try to think more holistically. Um, but th this is a really interesting conversation. We've got some more questions, but Lois, I didn't know if you wanted to come back on anything Rachel or Mike said. No, I thought about it, but I think um, I, I want to see how these questions evolve because okay. I probably be so, chiming in plenty later. <laughs> I, yeah, so the next one that we had um, was how has COVID, and this is a little bit what Rachel touched on, but how has mm -hmm. COVID, this current pandemic, really uh, shown us Rachel, racial, racial inequalities <laughs> and inequities? And yeah. what are your thoughts around as we face it and we face you know, therapeutics and vaccines, yeah. what can we all be doing as advocates and what should we be thinking about um, so that the disproportionate burden is not, you know, as it is now. So I'll 
I'll leave all three of you with that, but starting with you, Lois. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that question because that was the one thought I had as Rachel, Rachel was speaking. I'm like, well, this is, this is playing out right now, right? I mean, she's, she's right. And I, it's, it's painful, honestly, to think about um, how recent a history it is for us in the States. And I don't know if we remind ourselves enough of that. And so for context, I, my story is my mother integrated her school and she was born at home because she couldn't go to the white hospital. And so this is, you know, and this has affected my family and families like mine for generations. Um, and so, including today. Uh, and, and so we're even, I, I can't start talking about COVID without talking about the US context immediately and what data we see, what stories we're, we're hearing, forget, the, forget the, the data, just you know, listen to the anecdotes about black and brown people being affected um, for different reasons, right? Because of systemic racism and discrimination and the lack of access because of the position that these communities of color are placed in as essential workers, you know, people who um, need to be out there and put their, their lives and bodies at risk, um, e even in, in the middle of an emergency. Um, and even to go farther, right? I mean, they're, poor people are affected more than others, right? More than those of us with privilege. And this also plays out um, worldwide, we see in the, in the data there. And so that's, that's the reality of COVID. I think we are all very, very aware of that. Um, how, how do we address it now? I mean, you know, knowing is a lot of the problem. Um, um, I think what's hard is that these systems took a long time to put in place. So I don't, you know, I think what we're seeing now is how difficult it is to respond, recognizing um, those systems and those very real issues um, but really not being able to kind of change the way work is done because it's just so embedded, right? But I think moving forward, when we, as we, as new treatments or therapeutics come online, like you're saying, Martha, as we really look towards a vaccine, one of the things that we've been talking about at Global Health Council and plenty of other organizations that have really been loud about this is we absolutely have to be thinking about the most marginalized person, like the, the, the people farthest away from the, the innovation, from the access as we're developing these things. And so whether it's around cost, whether it's about distribution, whether it's about education, about its benefits or side effects or what have you, we need to, we collectively, uh, and in particular, the, the, the organizations or institutions really leading the way when it comes to, to vaccines and treatments, absolutely need to be thinking of these key populations because I, what, what has happened, what we've seen happen um, is that hasn't been the case. And, um, and you know, really glad to see something like the you know, COVAX facility be stood up um, and be co-led by groups like Gavi, CEPI, and WHO. I think that's a really good sign. Um, but each of us as advocates also need to be watching the space as different countries come in and try and buy a product and, you know, uh, potentially put us in a situation whereby there are winners and losers. Because really, if there are any losers when it comes to access, we all lose. That's the reality. And, and <laughs> enough with us, you know, leaving black and brown people behind, enough with us um, leaving um, the poor behind, enough with us leaving behind women and children, right? We have to really step up um, and stand up for those who need us because it turns out it saves our lives as well. Now, those are great points. And, and for those on the line, if you want to Google COVAX, um, I think you'll be able to understand this international effort. And the idea is protect the most vulnerable first, right? This isn't a nationalistic game like this country got the vaccine, they get to protect all their people. Um, certainly from an ethical point standpoint, but also, as we know, from a very practical standpoint, a disease anywhere, a disease everywhere. So um, I think this pandemic has shown that. But I, I wanted to, um, so for the participants, if you look up COVAX and you'll be able to learn how maybe you can advocate for that. But Rachel and Mike certainly wanted to give you an opportunity to weigh in on how you see, you know, this current pandemic really um, putting in sharp contrast the um, racial inequalities. Yeah, I mean, I kind of see, as Lois was saying, as the for the grassroots advocate side of things of being watchdogs. Um, to making sure that people that typically would not have access um, to um, medical health that, you know, make sure that local politicians, national politicians 
know if they're not being supported in the way that they need to be to be their voice. But also, we always talk about being someone else's voice. But I think we need to bring in their voices where they can work with them to speak on their back. You know, they can speak for themselves. Um, so making sure that we're being inclusive um, during this whole process. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, like UNA USA, we provide different opportunities to help people uh, lift up those voices, be it a petition uh, to make sure that WHO gets its funding or that we stay involved with WHO, um, or we have a petition um, with Representative Barbara Lee on the US Truth Racial uh, Healing and Transformation Commission, encouraging people to sign that. Uh, asking their members of Congress to uh, create such a commission so that we can um, learn more about the issues and be truthful about the issues that are happening in this country alone. So um, those are some of the things kind of um, on the ground of, of making sure that people's voices are heard, but also doing some advocacy actions and make sure that we have the right policies in place. Well, Rachel, while I have you, can you maybe talk a little bit about some of the work that UNA USA is doing, not just around the pandemic, but just kind of around racial justice? I'm sure everyone would love to hear. Yeah, so um, I'd love to start with one thing. Um, we worked on the review, the Universal Periodic Review, and this is um, where the U.S. Um, will go in front of the, the Human Rights Council to be judged on their human rights uh, in the US. So UNA USA participated uh, in consultations where members talked about race relations as one of the human rights that we discussed uh, in the US, how they're affected, how their community is affected, um, and ways that we think that we can improve in the US. And we submitted a report that went to um, the UN. So that's kind of one example of what we've done. But then the other thing is that our members, especially after um, the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and, and many others that have come to light um, during COVID, is that we've been having some um, serious conversations through town halls and coffee chats um, talking about um, the issue of race and systematic racism here in the U.S and also uh, resources that we need in order to educate ourselves and also to become better advocates um, is another thing that we've done. Um, and then just doing more advocacy work, um, trying to um, engage our members of Congress around this issue and also engage our community. So our chapters are doing some of their own things um, in their communities and then they also participate in the programs that we provide uh, around racial justice. Fabulous, thank you. Um, Mike, I wanted to ask you, you know, we have the advocates uh, on the line. Oh, sorry, did someone else want to talk? Oh, no, that, that, it, was, it was me. I, I just, before you get into that question, the yeah. one thing that I want to add to what Lois and, and Rachel have just said is yeah. on COVAX and, and the ACT Accelerator overall is, and, and Lois alluded to it, but I'm going to say it out loud. The United States is not a part of the ACT Accelerator. The United States has chosen to go alone and, and your members of Congress need to hear about that. And your members of Congress need to be pushing the administration to get back into the, or to get into the ACT Accelerator so that we can actually be a part of creating equitable access to therapeutics and the vaccine, period. So I'll get off my high horse. That that, that needs to be Mike, because I was going to say, what can our advocates on the line that advocate for, you know, malaria treatments, for vaccines, for the UN, you know, what are some concrete things they can do um, to actually ad address racial injustice? And so you just gave a great example how they can do it around uh, the current pandemic, but I didn't know if you had other thoughts around how each of our campaigns and our advocates can weave in some of these issues as they're um, doing advocacy. Well, I, and thank you. For, thank you for that question, Martha. And I, I think that that's really important. What, one of the first pieces of advice that we give to any um, person that's going up to the Hill is tell your story. This is how you make it the most powerful to members of Congress, the, that you need to tell your story. And, and telling the story about racial justice is, is 
absolutely integral to to understanding how we are going to choose uh, or how we are going to achieve equity, um, how we are going to achieve uh, a better, um, uh, a, a healthier world. Um, so when you tell your weaving in um, what you are passionate about, justice, ra racial justice, why you're passionate about equality, like that, that can be the, the, the starting off point for the conversation. The other, the other piece, and, I, and we, we should get more into this, is, is some of the aspects around um, the defunding of the, or the withdrawal from the, the World Health Organization right now and, and what the United States is doing. Um, the, 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 as all of you probably know, the U.S. has sent its letter of, of full withdrawal from the, of, of, from the World Health Organization. Um, it, if it will come into effect on July 6, 2021, if the, the administration doesn't go back on this. So calling on members of Congress that, that one, we need to fund WHO right now and members of Congress need to speak out in support of the World Health Organization. Um, the, the strategic plan that the, the World Health Organization is operating under right now for um, 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 uh, the COVID crisis was um, Dr. Tedros wanted to, wanted to wanted to achieve the triple billion, right? Um, a billion more people have access to health systems. A billion people will will um, um, will be protected against health emergencies, and a billion people with better lives, um, um, better health, and and well-being. So these are the, the 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 goals that this organization is trying to achieve. And the U.S. is about to pull its rug, pull the rug out from under it. Um, the U.S. provides about 18% of the total um, funding for WHO, and that does, and that includes a lot of the U.S. priorities that the WHO leads on, like polio, um, like tuberculosis. Um, um, so uh, it's it, it's just absolutely crazy to see what what is happening right now with with um, um, the WHO. So. Those are kind of my yeah my, no my thank you Mike so important and I know all of our campaigns have tools for you as advocates to and a lot of you advocates have helped us out and did a lot around um, when we thought we had there was a two week window for making this decision and then it was just made but um, I know a lot of you have reached out to members but feel free to reach out to any of our campaigns if you want further resources or or talking points around that. Um, I'd like to go to the Q&A now, um, and I'm going to read out this question and whoever, you know, all three of you can answer it or someone can just chime in to answer first. But um, how can we hold U.S. and European-based global health implementing organizations, how can we hold them accountable to have people of color represented in their leadership and in their community-driven programming? So I'd love to come back to um, to the commercial that um, Martha pointed out earlier in the in today's program. Um, the GHG again, we're a coalition of organizations and corporations, mainly the many um, the well-known groups uh, based in the states um, fighting these issues. And what we're doing in November. Uh, to share a little bit more about that is having a really deep conversation about the ways um, we um, or s many of our institutions are complicit uh, in these issues of uh, and in the challenge of racial inequity and injustice. Uh, I, I think it's important to look at this in the two parts that I think it was Rose who asked this question has because I, one of the things I've noticed happens is when we talk about race, we end up talking only about diversity and leadership, um, which is critically important. And one of the reasons why we're going to have a track for CEOs specifically at our summit this year, um, that's really going to call, um, call out these questions um, and, and some of the commitments that we've seen made uh, across our community to truly diversify both executive and board leadership in global health. So that's what's one area. But the, the other important piece, I think Rose pointed out in this question, is um, this idea of how we reconcile our kind of 
express mission of equity and justice for all with like what it is we're doing, what it is we're saying and really standing up for. And like Rachel said, there were, there were a couple of us or a few of us who came out with statements, particularly around the George Floyd, mur Floyd murder. But I would argue that we could have made those types of statements two, three, five, ten years ago, right? And we, we, we spoke up now, which is great. Um, why, why did we feel so hesitant to speak up before? Why did we feel there was a disconnect between what we do in global health or international health versus what's, what is happening at home? And so I think that is, that's something we also want to have a conversation about um, as part of this summit and something we're actually already starting to talk about through this video series we have going and a couple of other dialogues. Um, but the, the reality is this is, you know, it's, it's, how do we hold each other accountable? Well, we, you know, we, I think we do have the dialogue. I do think we also resist the urge to kind of have like a magic bullet when it comes to this stuff. This is, this is stuff that's been sitting and stewing for decades, right? For centuries. And so it's going to take a while to unpack it. And we, you know, we, we, we might feel like we found an answer and then we have to dig a little deeper and find another answer. But I know that I'm committed and we're committed at GHG to just continuing to dig and continuing to pick it apart just because we know how, how critically important it is for us to get to the root problem. So that's, you know, for what it's worth, um, those, those discussions are happening. Um, I, I think, I think, again, you know, we, we'd be remiss if we didn't, if we didn't sort of put it all on the table. Um, and I can go on with other examples of the disconnect, right? Maternal mortality in the States versus abroad. Like there's so many ways, like Martha mentioned, we can, we can connect these dots. And I'm really hopeful that, you know, not at the, just at the end of the day, but as we pursue these conversations, we'll just be able to unlock that much more in terms of what I can do as an individual and what we can do as an institution, because both of those pieces really matter. That's great. Thank you, Lois. I, I want to invite Rachel and Mike to, to also weigh in on the question of, you know, having people of color represented in leadership, but also in, you know, community driven programming and and yeah, I think um, two things. One, when it comes to, I'm thinking more so corporations and holding them accountable. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the purse string. Um, and for at a grassroots level um, to um, speak up and say, we're not going to buy your products anymore, to use social media, um, to kind of blast them out about their, their practices and policies and kind of force change. Um, and then the other thing would be my hope, Lois, in your program that CEOs uh, will kind of have peer pressure with each other. I feel like that's the only way it's, it's going to get done is that um, they kind of have a pact or an agreement saying we are going to make change, we are going to do this and hold each other accountable. I think that's what's going to be really important um, in that aspect. I don't know if Mike has anything else to. Maybe maybe one other thing to add, and, and um, I, I've been um, on, in a couple of these conversations around, uh, especially around centering voices, making sure that people, uh, especially um, for the programs that that you want to land, like, are brought in, actually a part of the conversation and helping to direct um, what what's going on. Those conversations can be really, really awkward to white people like myself. That's okay, and we need to continue to have those. We need to continue to have, like, like let's have, the, let's have these really, really awkward, really hard conversations, because without it, we're not gonna actually make any progress. And, and, um, and we'll all squirm a little bit, and that, that's okay. We're allowed to squirm, but, but we need to actually, we need to make, like real change um, because it's it it just like Lois said it's been centuries uh, and we're, we're we're things are getting better I guess but it's still not not where anywhere near it where it should be so great thank you Mike and uh, agree on on uh, let's have awkward conversations because certainly certainly it's time. Um, so to, to move on to the next question we had submitted, 
Uh, there's a question around if African-American communities that are being hit harder by COVID, sh should they receive some kind of additional resources or should they be, you know, some kind of recognition and, well, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll let, I'll let you guys, I assume this is um, because it's African-Americans talking about the U.S., but I think, you know, we work in global health, we can think about this sort of around the world. So not only for the COVAX, for the you know, the therapeutics and the treatments, but also, you know, the economic fallout and everything else. So it's, it's a big question. I'll, I'll leave it to the three of you. <laughs> and I'm just going to quickly start. Um, I feel that until people's health uh, are equal, then you need to add and provide as much support as possible. So the answer to me is yes. Uh, until, until those that are underserved are lifted up to where everyone has the same um, ability to have good health, then we need to support them as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Agree. <laughs> uh, I'd add, though, um, it's not just about money. And, and I've mm -hmm. heard this from folks in other countries who are like, look, it's great that the U.S. and advocates in the U.S. want to push for us to have more resources, but we also want power. We also want to dictate how that money is spent. And I think that was another question I ended up answering online, but you know, it's, it's, it's also critically important um, that we relinquish that control for mm -hmm. communities of color, um, for other communities um, who have been disadvantage in these deliberations and decision making. I mean, look, the reality is plenty of countries have actually done it right when it's come to COVID and we don't tell that story enough either. And so I would argue that that is a great case for continued investment in global health because there's so many countries that are like, yeah, no, we all agree to do things this way when this thing happened and this is what we did, right? And they're doing a lot of good work and a lot of important work to hold the line. And I, I would like to show our support for them continuing to hold that line and also do whatever we can, funding or otherwise, to help them push back any other like coming, you know, looming emergencies, right? Because there are ripple effects when it comes to COVID as well. Even if a country's doing all right when it comes to its COVID status, doesn't mean that it's not facing a whole bunch of other stuff, um, particularly when it comes to you know, what we have come to know as major global health priorities, HIV, TB, malaria, and the like. So I, you know, I, I, I think, yes, um, the money matters, and we should, um, I guess, what's the word I want to say, like, we should overcorrect, or we should really invest more heavily in those communities and countries that are at greater risk, and also we should, we should give them leeway to spend that however they see fit, and whether that's system or you know some other component um, of, of, of what's required I think we need to trust that and we need to do a lot of work now moving forward to build or rebuild that trust um, that mutual um, that mutual trust frankly so that we can all come out of this better well and just just lastly on on that point too it's and to the to the money point yes more money should be devoted because the systems have been in place for so long that are putting all of the like communities of color at a disadvantage period and that's so without fixing the system um you you're never going to actually get to the 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 equality that we're that we're that we all have promised everyone right promise them but we're putting systems in place that won't that won't allow uh, equality to flourish or to be uh, realized. Yeah, excellent points. And I think um, I, I particularly like your point, Lois, that it would be nice to see some more stories highlighted about countries that have done a great job, which is not the US, but countries that have listened to science, that have followed WHO guidelines, that took early warning seriously, because I think we have a lot to learn um, from from other countries. And as you said, you know, let them see and and I I hope that I felt like this has been a trend probably not big enough yet but to really work you know closely that the ministries of health are making these 
decisions, that resources are being freed up for them, but they are, are very much deciding on their, on their priorities. But I, I think those are, are fabulous points. Um, I'd like to move on to the next question, which is, um, we tell appropriators that global health is how you can help people in need and protect the United States while also maintaining enough accountability, ensuring the funds produce, a, this is what I think you were referring to earlier, Lois, about these specific measurable impacts. Um, that pitch seemed to have worked and save lives, but do you think it reflects racism in some ways? And how could we, what would you suggest for other framing and language around this? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak up because I mean, David, you, you heard me start with this, right? <laughs> and, and I think David's been a part of some of the conversations we've been trying to broker at GHG to, to rethink that narrative and what it means. I mean, to answer your initial question, yeah, I, I do think it reflects racism and white supremacy. That's just the way it is. Now, it could work, but it's also racist. Just want to make that clear. And so I, you know, I think especially in light of COVID, we could, mm, I don't know, think about ways that this is a mutually beneficial proposition. The US has a ton to learn. And I think the people from CDC will tell you this, right? People, you know, there, this is why there has always been an exchange, at least in my experience and understanding, when it's come to our own public health model. We, and I think we have done very well to uh, understand um, the value of partnership and international cooperation um, when it comes to things like fighting infectious diseases or addressing chronic diseases. I mean, look at the Thai public health model for it as an example. We all were educated in that going through master's in public health programs going back probably 20 years, right? Uh, and so it's, a, I, think, I think approaching it in a, in a humble way, I think is important. And I think the onus is on us, frankly, as advocates to challenge the narrative at home versus like making other people okay with how we talk about it. Because I think what happens, like, and I'm not picking on Dave, but I know he's, I know why he's asking this question. <laughs> um, but it's sort of like what I hear when folks are like, well, you know, it works to talk about our economy and our security. It's like, mm -hmm. well, but it hurts. And it also, I don't think it's that sustainable. I would argue that it's worked to a point, but now we're at a point where we can't get Congress to give in this critical time. You know, we can't get them to come up with any money for the, the work that we've been doing for decades. And I think it's partly because there has been this racist foundation to that. And, you know, I, I, would, I would put out there that perhaps we can think about how we shift that argument so that we're not in this position where folks feel like, oh, okay, well, we'll, you know, we'll give it to them like when they've earned it or when we can, or, you know, sort of this like nice to have versus must do. But if we think about the mutual beneficial, mutually beneficial nature of the work, I think that that's not as sort of wide a, a gap for us to bridge, right? Like then it will, I think it can be more automatic for decision makers to say, if nothing else, like, oh wait, they are doing it right in other parts of the world. And so we absolutely need to keep investing in these relationships and these partnerships so that we can learn from one another and vice versa. You know, um, I mean, we're running out of equipment here and we had all these shortcomings when it came to our response and mm -hmm. could be solved by not just international cooperation, but an acknowledgement of um, kind of all that countries traditionally seen as sort of having nothing to offer. Um, you know, if we can, if we can spin that to really recognize what, what they do bring to the table um, uh, for, 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 for the entire global community, I think it, it, it really helps us um, in the end. So I appreciate the question and I want to keep having that conversation because I think it's critically important. Yeah, I was just going to add that sometimes, well, not sometimes, Americans can be arrogant thinking that we you think we invest and we don't. And that's why at UNA USA, we have a phrase, global goals, local leaders, meaning that you have to localize the SDGs because we have a lot of issues. We have hunger issues. We have uh, health issues. We have education issues and they need to be addressed here. Um, and we can't be arrogant about it. Absolutely. And look, equity is a winner right now. You know, if nothing else, like 
we should lead with equity and the SDGs do this. It's just, we don't, you know, we as this country to Rachel's point, we don't, we haven't really adopted that, but that that's universal. And so I think to David's you know, question and more succinctly, we could lead with equity. Imagine that, imagine if we just talked about global health equity in a way that resonates at home and abroad and is you know, consistent or relevant at home and abroad. I don't know, maybe we can make some headway, but that's just one woman. Thank you. And, and I am aware that we are coming up uh, against time. So I think, you know, to summarize, I think we all agree we have to be intersectional in our approach to, to global health. Uh, I wanted to just give a tremendous thank to Lois, Rachel, and Mike. Really, I think we had a fabulous discussion. And I want to give a really big shout out to Michaela, Victoria, and Lindsay the interns at Shot at Life that pulled this whole thing together. This was a tremendous amount of work and really just did a very thoughtful job on, on how they pulled it together. And you know, knowing that we have more than 100 people registered, 50 people on right now, clearly it's something we should be doing more of. So thank you again to our interns for leading the way on this. And I'm assuming you know everyone put in their Twitter handles. So if you have specific questions for any of our panelists or you can go through uh, any of us at Shot at Life and we can you know, share the questions. But thank you everyone so much for tuning in and thank you to our, our fabulous panelists. I think this was a great discussion and hopefully just the start of many more. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Okay, Thanks. bye. Thanks Shot at Life.